Whether you're new to Empire at War Expanded or have been playing for years, you may have some questions about how certain factions work. Maybe you want to play as them, and maybe you want to crush them. I'm not here to judge. Today we're going to be starting a series of factional guides for all of the Empire at War Expanded mods by breaking down the Galactic Republic, explaining how their roster works, how their government mechanics work, and some tips on how to set yourself up for success while playing as them. For broader mod mechanic information, I've already done a video covering the basics of Fall of the Republic for new players. So for these videos, while I'll give some quick refreshers on a few mechanics, we'll be focusing mainly on the factions themselves. First, we'll start by going over the Republic's roster, including how they become available, and their roles or ways to best use them. Some units are available only once certain research has been done, or after the era has progressed. Eras represent different years of the Clone Wars, with Era 1 being pre-war and only in the From the Ground Up Galactic Conquest currently. Era 2 is the first year, Era 3 the second year, and Era 4 the third. There is not currently an Era 5. While historic campaigns are set in a specific time period, the progressive maps can be chosen to start in whichever era you want, changing what's available from the start, as well as changing your starting forces. During this video, when I say something is available from the beginning though, I'm ignoring the Era 1 start, we'll cover that a bit on its own later, we're going to be mostly focusing on the Clone Wars themselves. We'll start with probably the most iconic of the Republic ships, the Venator. Venators will come to be a staple of your fleets, but they must first be researched if you are starting an Era 2. The Venator research will unlock 11 weeks into the game. Make sure you're always checking your different build tabs on different planets so that you don't miss anything that you might have available. If you start in Era 3 or 4, the Venator will be available from any planet with a level 3 or 4 shipyard. The shipyard level of planets is indicated by the number on under their names. While Venators do have powerful weaponry and very strong fighter complements, you'll want to avoid having them brawl too heavily with CIS ships. It's very good at its role with the powerful NTB heavy bombers and versatile fighters it provides, and it does put out a good amount of damage while being relatively durable for its size, but you shouldn't go into playing Fall of the Republic expecting one ship to do everything for you. The cost of all units in the mod, both in credits and in pop cap, is directly related to how powerful it is, both in its offensive stats, its defensive stats, and in its fighter complements. You can see a full breakdown of unit stats, including how many fighters and bombers they provide, by hovering over the unit's icon and pulling up its unit card. When it comes to the fighter and bomber numbers on the unit cards, the first number is how many are deployed at the start, and the second number is how many they have in reserve to replace those first ones if they're destroyed. A bomber always refers to a unit that has proton bombs and proton rockets. Some fighter types, like the ARC-170, have proton torpedoes, which does mean that they are able to do some damage against capital ships but not on quite the same level as the dedicated bombers. When going with a Venator-focused strategy, using your own fighters and some anti-fighter corvettes to establish fighter superiority and allow your bombers to take over the battle will go a long way. The heavy turbo laser hardpoints on the Venator allow it to sit back and engage from afar, and as you clear some space, you can move it in so the medium turbo lasers can join, and this will help you maximize their damage while keeping the ship safe. Next, we'll cover another mainstay of your fleet, the Acclimator. The Acclimator actually comes in three different versions. The one has the carrier and assault loadouts, based on the in-universe examples Navuda B and the Leveler for those interested, and then there's the Acclimator 2. Visually, they're identifiable by the assault variant lacking most of the red markings on the ship and icon, with a missile pip on its icon, and the two having a two in Roman numerals on its icon. Both of the Acclimator 1 variants are available from the start. In terms of their weaponry, while there's some differences going from the light lasers on the carrier to the mediums on the assault variant, the primary difference here are the powerful concussion missile launchers on the assault variant, making them able to engage from a bit higher range and excel against larger targets, or smaller targets that have clustered hardpoints, though they will lose out on some of of that damage when going up against units with point defense capabilities, which are listed at the bottom of units' info cards when available. Both ships are also carriers though, making them able to do mixed duty much like the Venator. The dedicated carrier version obviously has more fighters overall, both at once and in reserve, and primarily puts out two bomb squadrons compared to the one of the assault variant. While the Acclimator 2 drops most of the fighter complement to become a dedicated damage dealer for only 10 pop cap, before even considering the impacts of power to weapons, it's able to put out some of, if not the highest damage per pop cap point in the mod. While its focus on light turbo lasers means it doesn't have a huge range, 
This makes it particularly accurate against small ships like the Diamond and the Kolovex Corvettes, which also makes them natural partners for the carrier fleets being threatened by those, so teaming acclimators up with other acclimators works quite well. The Acclimator 2 is only available in the final year of the war. With the carrier heavy elements of the Republic's fleet out of the way, let's talk about their brawlier capitals. First up is the Invincible class. This early game capital does also function as a bit of a carrier, but its primary use in the opening stages of the game is going to be as a damage soak. It has a powerful array of turbo lasers and most importantly assault concussion missile launchers, so once enemy point defense is cleared out, it and its bomber complement can also do considerable damage. If you arrange some acclimators behind it with some anti-fighter corvettes as additional support, that's one good option for a solid core fleet in the first era. The Invincible does lock at the end of the first year of the Clone Wars though, so make sure to grab a few while you can, because you will not be able to replenish them later. While you lose out on the Invincible there, a few weeks later you'll be able to research the the Victor Initiative Project, which starts you down the path to the Victory 1 and 2 Star Destroyers, filling a similar role to the Invincible as your Brawly Capitals. The Victory 1 takes on the Assault Concussion Missile Launcher for bigger targets and great station assault capabilities, though a Missile Salvo along with its light turbo lasers can also help take out some smaller ships thanks to their accuracy, as long as there's not too much point defense around to clear the missiles. The Victory 2, on the other hand, focuses on medium and heavy turbo lasers, sacrificing that accuracy against smaller targets for the extra range and turbo laser focus. It's also notable that the VSD-2 has heavy ion cannons. Ion cannons do great shield damage, but they don't damage ships' hulls. They're particularly useful for softening up a target's shields quickly, but the era, especially on the Republic side, is quite sparse when it comes to ion cannons. For more of your mid-sized frigates fitting into a slightly smaller size bracket than your acclimators, there are the Dreadnoughts. The primary version of this you'll interact with is the Dreadnought Heavy Cruiser, boasting a considerable amount of heavy turbo lasers compared to the light turbo lasers of the Acclimator 2. Note again that having heavy or light lasers doesn't mean you're necessarily doing more or less damage per se. A ship with light turbo lasers will generally fire more often, but in general light weapons will be better against small targets because of the accuracy, and the damage of heavier weapons will usually be more reliable against larger targets while able to stay back at a longer range, though they are much worse at hitting small targets. On top of these heavy turbo lasers, the Dreadnought also has some self-defense against fighters with its heavy lasers, and it has some medium ion cannons. There are two further versions of Dreadnoughts you'll see while playing. The PDF, or Planetary Defense Force Dreadnought, is a more lightly armed version which has medium grade and fewer turbo lasers but no ion cannons. These will primarily be found in your starting forces or integrated sector forces, and are indicated by a dash at the top of the icon. You can upgrade the PDF dreadnoughts to heavy carriers at any planet where they are stationed, using the dreadnought icon with the green arrow. Next we'll move on to the smaller ships of your fleet. Quite often these get undervalued because they're coming in smaller packages, but being able to specialize your fleet with more use of small frigates and corvettes can be incredibly powerful, and their small size makes them harder to hit and easier to maneuver around. Since they also don't have targetable hardpoints, they benefit quite a bit from fleet tenders. Fleet tenders are ships which are able to repair other ships around them passively throughout the battle. Having two or three in a group of corvettes or frigates can help keep them safe and pumping out damage throughout a battle, and provide a benefit you rarely ever get for larger ships. While larger ships' hardpoints can be repaired, once a hardpoint is dead, it can't be returned. Fleet tenders are indicated by a green plus in a unit's icon. For the Republic, these are the Galleon from similar sources as the PDF Dreadnought, and the core roster version is the Pelta Fleet Tender. On top of its healing abilities, the Pelta Tender can deploy interdiction mines to prevent the enemy from escaping, and because of its rapid laser cannons, it can shoot down incoming missiles and bombs. The regular Pelta, or the Pelta Assault variant, doesn't have the repair abilities, but on top of being still durable for its size, it doubles both the projectile interception, so its ability to shoot down missiles and bombs, as well as its fighter damage, while adding in light triple turbo lasers to help it take down enemy corvettes. For more dedicated point defense and anti Fighter, you have the LAC and the CR-90 Corvettes, which, like the Peltas, are always available. For pop cap efficiency, the CR-90 is better considering its improved stats, but the LAC is a bit cheaper, so if you're planning to spend more money elsewhere, they can be a suitable replacement. 
In a fleet with a lot of fighters, for example, you may want to save those 50 credits to spend on the carriers. Having sufficient anti-fighter in battles is incredibly important, and on top of helping against bombers, point defense can help shut down the damage output of ships like the Providence class on the CIS side. The CIS relies on swarms of fighters and bombers, so don't underestimate what they'll be able to do to unprotected larger ships, and always try to keep a few LACs or CR90s in your fleets at all times. You won't regret it. The AI does tend to build the counter what you have, so you also don't want to over-index in any specific fleet makeup. Next, we have a trio of offensive frigates and corvettes, the Carrick, Arquitens, and DP-20 gunship. The DP-20 is the smallest and acts as an anti-ship corvette with a mix of missiles, light lasers, and turbo lasers. In numbers, they can quickly rip through enemy ships. The Arquitens has a nice mix of medium weaponry and missiles, making it a solid and versatile choice for any occasion. The Carrick, on the other hand, is more specialized towards heavier turbo lasers. If you give a few of these a try, especially with some fleet tenders, you shouldn't be disappointed in the result. On top of the advantage of being small and able to heal with fleet tenders, one of the other advantages of using smaller ships is that you can more easily divide up your fire between different targets or hardpoints. With larger ships, you can only choose to attack one thing at a time, but if instead of a victory, for example, you had equal pop cap in smaller ships, you get the dodge tanking benefits and be able to tell smaller groups to hit different targets. Your goal when building your fleet should be to find different ship types that work well with and complement each other. Finally, we'll get to the Republic's battlecruiser and super ship, the Praetor and Mandator. The Praetor is always available, as is the Mandator, but the Mandator is built in two stages. First, you have to build the Mandator 1, which can then be upgraded to the Mandator 2 for improved armor and weapons. Both ships are able to deal a lot of damage themselves, including loadouts with the rare Republic Ion Cannons, but are also particularly vulnerable to fighters. When using them, it'll be important to escort them with sufficient anti-fighter or carriers. Because they do have considerable Ion weapons, Weaponry. One option on how to use them is to focus first on having them strip the shields on any big targets around, and allow the rest of your fleet to finish those ships off while you move the Mandator on to the next target to keep the damage output from the Ion Cannons at full use. These battlecruisers are great for taking on Lucrehulks, whose distributed firing arcs make them fantastic against spread out smaller targets, but really bad against single or concentrated ships. You do need to watch out for the Subjugator's single target stun, or the Lucrehulks fighter complements though. They are far from being necessary to beat Lucrehulks. Once you're aware that Lucrehulks have equal firing arcs everywhere, and are unable to concentrate their fire on one individual area, a much smaller amount of ships are able to sit within the same bank and safely hammer down the Lucre Hulk shields, then take out the weapons on that bank, making it basically a 70 pop cap sitting duck. Acclimators of any type with their power to weapons abilities are great for this, though the lasers and fighter complements of a Lucre Hulk do make them less vulnerable to bombers. Four or five acclimators of any type can usually safely focus down a Lucre Hulk alone with no losses in a single battle. There are four more types of ships available to the Republic through their government mechanics and a few other ones available in the era one start from from the ground up, but we'll talk about those a little bit later on in the video. For ground, there's a bit less research, but you'll still see your roster change as the eras progress. We'll go through each category of your ground forces now, mentioning era changes as they happen, starting with infantry. There are a few main options for infantry. Regular clone troopers, arc troopers, and clone commandos. Each company of each kind of infantry comes with a variety of weapon types listed in their tooltip, making different squads able to accomplish different goals. To see specialized equipment at a glance, infantry have pips under them indicating what type of special weaponry they may have, including grenadiers and clones with heavy rotary cannons. As the Republic, your infantry are going to be very important and versatile, with vehicles generally supporting them in various ways. While clone commandos have slightly more homogeneous weaponry than troopers or arcs, they do have self-healing which, when paired with personal shields and slightly higher speeds, can make them better able to self-sufficiently jump in and out of engagements against battle droids and other targets, and their ability to swap to sniper rifle attachments means they can engage infantry at a longer range, though all of this comes at a credit cost over the other infantry options. Early in Era 3, you'll be given the opportunity to research Phase 2 clone armor, which upgrades your general clone troopers and arc troopers. This upgrade, which comes with a modest stat increase, only applies to clone clones that are trained after the research completes, it does not retroactively swap out all of your phase ones that already exist. In battles, you're also able to build field bases on build pads at landing zones, which we talked about a fair bit in the beginner's guide video for Fall of the Republic. On the Republic side, there is the basic military field base, which gives you 
some regular troopers, the support field base which gives a squad that is able to heal other infantry and repair vehicles, the guerrilla field base which gives things like arc troopers, and the scouting field base which gives clone jump troopers. Check the descriptions of all field bases to see what they provide and which best suits your needs in a given battle. Field bases in general are great for securing additional territory and getting more support for your final assault on the enemy base or in denying the landing zones on defense. There are a lot of armor design variations for clone troopers in Star Wars, so rather than try to introduce them as different redundant buildable units, in Fall of the Republic the Legion skins are based on heroes present in the battle. Some clone variations, like Senate Guards, are used for other specific purposes, like building garrisons. For others, if a hero has a Legion skin associated with them, they will have a tag at the bottom of their tooltip saying so, and when they're in battles, any clones brought in after them will have the armor associated with that Legion. The tier tells you which gets priority when multiple heroes are present. Aside from just making your infantry look cooler, your Jedi heroes are going to be a big part of what you try to do as the Republic. Jedi are fantastic against infantry but struggle more against vehicles, aside from some who have the crush ability. Generally, getting shot by infantry will actually allow them to absorb some of the damage or reflect the blaster bolts back at the infantry. With some careful management, they can become one-person armies, avoid the vehicles or take them on in small groups, and go right after the infantry when possible. Jedi are also able to use force abilities to quickly get through buildings. In space, they do have fighters, but these are basically just glorified transports currently. Like the regular Jedi, they will get fleshed out a bit more in the future, but for now, don't try to use them as space units, they'll probably die. On top of these standard infantry, you'll sometimes have or receive PDF troopers, much like the PDF dreadnoughts. These represent the local forces of the Republic world which formed the bulk of the Republic side in the Clone Wars. While not as elite or versatile as clone troopers, they're still of reasonable quality. You also have SD-6 battle droids whose light ion cannons and anti-infantry weapons are great support for other infantry companies or vehicles. Finally, you're able to train Jedi from the Jedi Temple, we won't spend too much time on these right now since they're largely a rough implementation at the moment. They will get properly fleshed out in the future. Next up, we have speeder bikes. At the start of the war, your option for this is the 74Z, which gets replaced by the Bark Speeder in Era 4. You'll also unlock the Infantry Support Platform or ISP in Era 3, which is a bit sturdier in sustained combat though less mobile than the other regular bikes. While a lot of players either don't value these or only value them for their ability to drop a powerful bomb in enemy infantry squads to kill them all, don't underestimate their guns. Speeders are able to quickly do a lot of damage and get out, responding to whatever they're needed for on the battlefield but also being great anti-infantry in general. As with space, always make sure to check the unit cards to see what exactly something is armed with. Lasers can be either anti-vehicle or anti-infantry for example. The ATRT available throughout the war similarly has an anti-infantry cannon but also comes with shorter range proton grenades and a sprint ability allowing them to match the mobility of your bikes. Between scout bikes and ATRTs, you have several options to quickly reach and secure landing zones for troops to come and capture, or to quickly shift between multiple fronts and respond to enemy attacks. The Republic has two further light walkers, the ATPT and the ATXT. The ATPT is a fantastic anti-infantry option. While it's not as mobile as the bikes in the ATRT, it does have some useful secondary support abilities. ATPTs will passively repair themselves over battles, and they have built-in point defense that can shoot down incoming rockets. With this combination, a properly positioned ATPT squad can hold against enemy infantry for quite some time. When stationed with a tankier vehicle or in support of your main infantry companies, having some ATPTs can make your life much easier, just like anti fighter corvettes in space. The ATXT is more specialized against light vehicles with its anti vehicle lasers and proton grenades, light vehicles being something the CIS has no shortage of. While more niche and situational than some other vehicles, they're quite good at their specialty and are worth building several of early, particularly because they're only available to build in Era 2. Next is the medium tank of the Republic, the TX-130 Sabre. These tanks are essentially an agile anti-vehicle platform, which can also raid bases pretty effectively. They aren't as durable as some of the vehicles we're going to be talking about in a minute, but their ability to traverse water and their regening shields is great for hit and fade attacks, or just generally quickly reaching areas 
areas on the map that may take much longer for your heavy vehicles to get to. Next we have the five primary core vehicles for the Republic forces which will usually want at least one of in your armies. Not one of each, but at least one of one of them. These are the ATTE, the UTAT, the ATOT, and the Juggernaut. Each fills a similar role of beefy main assault vehicle, though each with their own take on that. The ATTE is probably the most versatile, with a mix of its anti-vehicle mass driver cannon and a plethora of anti-infantry options. It also has an AOE infantry heal, making it a great support element for the infantry doing the bulk of your work, and it can transport a few squads as well. The ATOT gives up some of those capabilities for a still good mix of damage types, though at less of a range, and its main utility is in its ability to deploy an extra squad of clones to the battlefield. Unlike the other vehicles in this category, they also come in two per company. Keeping the ATTE as our frame of reference, the UTAT drops some of the anti-infantry weapons and infantry healing, along with some of the durability for a bit more anti-vehicle damage, and crucially the ability to traverse areas of water and lava, something that it shares with the TX-130. The ATAP gives up most anti-infantry and infantry support for an even longer range main cannon. This can be especially helpful for assaulting things like turbo laser emplacements or other heavy vehicles before they can engage along with getting some extra anti-vehicle themselves in a second cannon. The UTAT and ATOT both only become available in Era 4. The most divergent from this formula is the Juggernaut, which comes in a few variants itself. We're going to be talking about the A5 here, which is the main version available. The A5 trades a lot of the damage capabilities compared to the other options for more mobility, defensive stats, and increased infantry transport capabilities. If you want to quickly secure territory across the map with a heavy vehicle and some infantry in tow, the Juggernaut is the best bet for that. They do struggle to turn, but they can drive either forwards or backwards, so in a lot of cases that shouldn't matter. The Republic also has several aircraft options in both speeder and gunship form. For speeders, you start off with the small but agile GABA-18, which has anti-infantry weaponry. In Era 3, you then lose the GABA but gain the Flashblind, a much bigger and beefier option with a mixture of anti-infantry and anti-vehicle weaponry, which can also speed boost its way out of danger with a spoiler lock ability. For gunships, you have the iconic LAAT, which has a good mix of weaponry, kind of like a flying ATTE, and is great at ferrying soldiers around and capturing landing zones, or even for hit and fade base attacks. The AJET, which unlocks in Era 4 when the Flashblind locks, takes on a more stationary mix between the Lat and the Flashblind, lacking the Lat's infantry support and a bit of the weaponry variety, but able to engage from generally longer ranges with its main cannon and having extra health and shield strength to keep it alive for longer. Next, we have the Republic Anti-Air and Artillery Units. The Anti-Air Unit is the UTAA. On top of being great against air units, flak from AA can also be used against lighter vehicles or infantry. It's good to keep at least one in reserve in your armies just in case. The AV-7 artillery though is indispensable as part of your forces. Artillery have massive ranges that can sometimes cover the entire map, allowing them to shell in trench positions or even hit base structures from afar. Their area of effect allows them to sometimes wipe out entire infantry squads in one hit. It's much easier to take enemy landing zones that have field bases built on them when you have some artillery around. They are quite fragile though, and do need to be deployed, so they will require secure front lines or direct protection. Finally, we have the A6 Juggernaut. This is a massive two-population unit with a wide array of weapons, a huge health pool, and which can sometimes run over ground battles on their own. It does have destroyable hardpoints though, so you need to be careful. These can't be built through standard means, but instead throughout the game you'll be offered missions from the Republic Senate to do things like take specific planets or stockpile money. The reward for one of these missions will give you an A6 Juggernaut. While that's the core roster of the Republic for the Clone Wars, we do still have to talk about the units related to the government mechanics which I mentioned earlier, and there are a few additional vehicles and ships you can sometimes get through integration or sector forces, your own starting forces, or primarily by playing the From the Ground Up campaign in the Special Era 1 start. This era limits you to pre-Clone Wars tech for your units only. Keep in mind, From the Ground Up is a challenge map which starts you off with one planet, and does not progress in era. So if you start there, you stay there. As a challenge mode, it's meant for when you're more familiar with the game's mechanics, so we won't go too in-depth on it here. 
but once you are comfortable with the mod's mechanics, it can provide an interesting challenge and an opportunity to use some units you may never see otherwise, like the Overracer speeder bike and the ULAV. This finally brings us to Galactic Conquest. We'll use the small progressive Galactic Conquest as our example in this guide, so specifics will vary, especially if you happen to be watching this in a later version, but the principles should always remain the same. Before we get to specifics on strategy, we'll go over the government mechanics of the Republic a little bit. The Republic government mechanics, which you can see in more detail by opening the government menu with the orange button on the left side of the screen in Galactic Conquest, have three parts. The first of the three mechanics is your command staff. This allows you to choose from a set of different heroes to lead your fleets, a sector army commander, and then three command staff slots. The number will change per Galactic Conquest though. In our example Galactic Conquest here, you'll start the campaign with Adder Talon and Gilad Pelion already filling two of your slots, but that leaves you two powerful and cheap heroes and ships that you can recruit with the final ones. You can retire or change the command staff at any point from the hero's location using their icon with the green indicator on it in the political options menu. Each hero has their own benefits and may sometimes have unique ships or ships which change over the eras, so get whomever appeals to you. Going for high command tiers can be especially helpful for your fleets, and options like Grumby or Cole Searden can provide an early and cheap influx of powerful units with their invincibles. Make sure to take advantage of the ability to swap them around as your needs change. For example, Lynch Hauser's local spy network can give you plenty of valuable information in exchange for not having quite the same power in his individual ship. You can also move heroes to different fleets across the galaxy by retiring them and then rehiring them on a disconnected planet to bolster defenses there. They still cost money, but they build quite quickly and can be more than worth the investment. If you lose a hero in battle, they're completely removed from the pool and you'll need to pay some credits to reopen the slot. If you're unsure who you want to recruit, there's two question mark icons which will recruit a random hero from that category and save you the stress. Next is the Order 66 and 65 choice. As you conquer planets and complete Senate missions, on top of the rewards like the A6 Juggernaut mentioned earlier, you'll be gaining influence with the Republic Senate. The starting value here will depend on a few factors like the map size, but once you hit 100, you'll be approached by Mon Mothma and Palpatine, each one asking you to support their side. Siding with Palpatine starts the road towards Order 66, which eventually kills off all your Jedi heroes, but in the short term opens up Kuat Drive Yard's contracts, which, once built have a chance every week to give you either an Imperial Star Destroyer, a Tector which is a fighterless Star Destroyer built for ship to ship combat, or a Secutor which is a massive carrier. These kinds of capital ships have few rivals in the Clone Wars period, and even a single one can significantly change how you're building your fleets, though again at the expense of any Jedi Major heroes you may have left. If you choose to side with Mon Mothma in the Delegation of 2000, you're largely saying that you want to keep the Jedi Order intact, which will admittedly be more attractive once regular Jedi are somewhat more fleshed out if you've already managed to lose all of your Jedi Major heroes. It does also give access to the Neutron Star as a small carrier option though. Both sides do get different sets of heroes when going down these paths, so without spoiling too many options, it is worth giving each one a try eventually and checking out your command staff options. Third are the Republic Sector Forces. These are technically another faction on the map, with a darker red color and mark with your faction logo under them. These planets will not attack, but will join you on the first era change after the game starts, if any have survived. While many will be quickly wiped out, they are a handy buffer to have between you and the CIS, particularly in the north. The later the area you start in, the fewer their planets will be. The CIS similarly is divided into five factions at the start of the campaign the main CIS, and four sub-factions. The first week of a Republic campaign can seem a bit overwhelming since the CIS factions are all independent and therefore are able to attack independently, though that should calm down after the first few attacks. It also means they're not able to benefit as much overall and can be easier to shut down each one, though the main CIS will be trying to integrate the other four and bring all their resources together. Generally, with any conquest in Empire at War, you want to divide the galaxy into a few theaters. You can mix up where you're focusing for each campaign, but I'll give a few suggestions for how I like to approach the Republic in the small progressive map. You have two major sections to your territory as the Republic, the core and the area near Kamino and Rathana to the southeast. Mon Calamari is isolated in the northeast, Ariata to the southwest, and Kashyyyk is also isolated a bit in the mid-rim, though only one jump out from your other planets. 
you want to make a few decisions early on on where you're going to defend in space, where you're going to defend on the ground, and where you're not going to defend at all. It may be worth upgrading Mon Calamari to a level 5 station and giving it a hypervelocity gun, but beyond that you'll probably want to leave it alone for the start. The sector forces to the north of the core will probably fall quickly, but it should give you time to combine some of your fleets and figure out how you want to handle your choke points. When a planet is freshly taken, it also means that planet won't have any defensive structures and can provide a good opportunity to attack a fleet which may not expect it. Coruscant and Kuat should also be planets that you heavily fortify, and then you'll want to work towards connecting your territory. But don't be afraid to give up too many fringe planets that you can't defend if you have to. The AI, when playing on medium or easy, will build with similar or fewer credits than you. And they do also build at relatively the same speed or slower than you, so any losses you can inflict on them will stick. Certain important AI planets do start with a static defense fleet which you'll have to whittle down to take the planet, but which the AI cannot use to attack you unless you turn on cruel mode. Beyond that, anything the AI has, they have to build. Generally, you'll want to look at taking out planets which close off or centralize areas of attack towards you. If you can get worlds where the avenues to attack are longer than where you'd be moving your fleets around, like if they have to go from the northeastern planets down to Rishi and Kamino, you can even stay on the offensive while still moving back in time to defend before an attack can hit. On the core side, you have Vulpter, Forost, Fondor, and Cato Neomoidia, which are all very valuable worlds, and while they're hard to take, you may want to practice with some smaller battles first, they can be a huge boon to your economy and production, while simultaneously nearly knocking the Techno Union and Trade Federation out of contention. If you check the south, Hypori is a powerful world with a static defense fleet, but it's isolated. If you can build up in the south, it may be worth taking it, but focusing on Tatooine and Christophsis should be easy early targets for your Rathana and Kamino based forces. In my campaigns, I often work to connect those areas to Ariadu while moving a fleet south from the core through Fondor, which can help stop the CIS from becoming a major threat in that region at all. Again, there's any number of ways to go about this, but those are just some basics you may find helpful, and the specifics will vary depending on the map. Throughout all of this, just make sure you're staying ahead of your resources in production and not leaving yourself open to too many attacks. That's going to do it for our guide to the Galactic Republic. If you found it helpful, please leave a like. I do plan to do one of these for every faction in Thrawn's Revenge and Fall of the Republic over the release of Point 2. If you want to see more direct usage of everything or see what's in store for the mod in future versions, you can check out the previews I also do on this channel. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.